The next talks, actually two talks, will be about, yeah, somehow about saving the world and saving the environment. Um, we will have two different ways of saving them. Um, the first talk is saving the world with space solar power. It's held by Stefan and Anja, and they work as space engineers in Berlin at the Technical University. That talk will be followed by another approach which is introduced to you by Christoph. He has a PhD in theoretical physics and his former work was, yeah, he was working with higher loop perturbation theory and supersymmetric Young Mills theories. And now he is doing air, airborne wind energy. And that will be his talk also. Please give the three of them a warm applause. Jetzt ist euer Turn. Ich gehe runter. Ja, hallo. As you have heard, today we are trying to save the world with introducing you to two very different approaches of um, sustainable energy generation. Um, we are three, the three of us, and um, we start with uh, Stefan. Yeah, hello everyone. Thanks for having us here. And, and me with our um, talk about space solar power. Of course, we have an outline, and I will uh, start the introduction with uh, showing you this um, very nice picture. Here you see the Earth at night, also known as the black marble. It's um, a very interesting picture because um, it, it uh, illuminates you or it shows you where people live, or at least where people have electric energy. But there's more information in this picture. When you start um, comparing these, uh, these pictures from different years, you also can see how certain um, um, regions are developing. And you also see where suddenly it gets dark, where there's been a catastrophe or, um, or a war or um, something like that. So um, the availability of electricity is an indicator for human development. We still have an increasing demand of power. This is also something we can see with that picture. But unfortunately, currently, this power demand is um, largely covered by fo uh, fossil resources. So yes, we need definitely renewable, sustainable energy, such as solar power, wind parks, water plants, or even other solutions. The thing with um, terrestrial bound um, so, um, energy plants is that um, they are bound to a certain location on Earth normally. So you either need to decentralize them, having a lot everywhere, or um, you need a lot of the transfer infrastructure. The other thing is, um, especially when thinking about uh, wind or uh, solar power, um, that the availability is very varying and is bound to certain um, conditions. So you need to store the energy. When, coming, uh, when talking about solar energy, of course, I mean, we have the day-night cycle, we have uh, the atmosphere, so we have weather interferences, so why not go into space? There are some selling arguments, or some really selling arguments, about space solar power. As I already said, it's uh, sustainable because it's uh, sun-powered. Um, Space generally is very, very large. So um, <laughs> we, can, we can build quite big uh, structures without covering any, uh, any space, any area on Earth. Um, we are, it, it is possible to have um, sun, sunlight on our satellites up there all around the clock. And we don't have an atmosphere, so there is no weather. So space solar power promised to have an unlimited, constant, and predictable energy source. That's cool, good. In addition, we don't need that much uh, infrastructure um, to distribute the, um, the power on Earth. For example, if you would compare that to, to a huge um, solar field, uh, for example, in the Sahara, you would need a lot of cables in order to, to get the power, for example, to Europe. This comes with some uh, problems. Um, 
But also, if solving the, the problem of, um, of power transmission, you can, uh, you can get energy to very, very remote locations on Earth, and you also can get the energy there quite quickly. And, um, of course, the intervention in the landscape is, le let's call it minimized to a certain way. This concept of space solar power actually isn't that young. It's, um, there, there's a, a patent from Peter Glacier from the 70s who already proposed um, a method and apparatus for converting solar radiation to electrical power. And here you see, do you, yeah, so there's a small red spot. I'm not sure whether you can see that. But um, you already see that he um, introduces all the components that are in need. Of course, we need the Earth, we need some large area for solar, for sun collection, and we need some, um, some antenna in order to transmit this power. Since the 70s, these uh, concepts were actually discussed all along. Since, since then, they were, were discussed. And the state-of-the-art um, approach in, um, for that is called SPS Alpha, which stands for uh, Solar Power Satellites by the mean of Arbitrary Large Phase Array. Um, it's the best documented approach in that area, which comes with a Phase 1 study financed by NASA in um, 11, um, 2011 and um, uh, 12. And they suggest um, a satellite structure based on the geostationary orbit, which is non-moving, um, gravity gradient stabilized. It's collecting the sun um, with a very, very large um, mirror um, array, and it transmits the power with a microwave beam. It looks like that, for example, or it could look like that, it's like, a, like a wine glass. It could look like a puddle. Um, but there are three main components here. So we have the, um, the sun reflector mirrors. This is um, this very, very large shape. These uh, sun reflecting mirrors are made of um, actually um, solar sail materials, so extremely lightweight, although they are so big. The core piece of this, um, of this installation are the uh, so-called hex modules, which you see here. And they host both the, um, the, the solar array, the, the solar panels, and um, the wireless power um, transmission modules. We come to that later. And then, of course, you also need the structure which holds everything together. In addition to that, you need some... Um, some support structures like little robots um, combining, fixing, exchanging modules and so on, but they are not further discussed yet. But the NASA approach isn't the only one. There's also an approach from, from JAXA. This is a um, Japanese space agency. They call their approach tethered SPS. It's also a gravity gradient um, stabilized approach, which you can see here. Um, the idea is basically the same, but they don't have the mirrors. Their selling argument is, um, yeah, you know, our, our system is so simple, we are sure it will work somehow. But they also say that it's not as, um, as efficient as, as the other approaches. In addition, there are Japanese scientists involved in the um, SPS Alpha study. But uh, what I think is most interesting, there are also um, a lot of Japanese approaches um, driving forward the uh, wireless power transmission. Then there's a new, quite new approach. This is uh, from the Chinese Space Agency, of CAST, and they suggest a multi-rotary joint SPS, which you can see here. So um, here in this, the, this yellow spot over here also is the transmi transmission antenna, but they have their solar arrays um, um, bound in this structure, which is approximately like 10 kilometers wide. And um, they adjust the position of their solar panels um, according to the sun position. So this is how they try to um, increase the, um, the efficiency. There's also a paper from, uh, from, from Europe, which is uh, quite old, but I'm not aware of, um, of, of a current work on, uh, on European ground here. 
If we summarize some of the core parameters of these uh, three documented or still discussed approaches, we come to this um, nice table. So we are talking about um, a power transmission between one and two gigawatts. These entire structures have a mass of um, about uh, 10,000 tons, metric tons, or even, um, even more as the Japanese approach. The antennas are quite big. We come to that later. Um, this comes with a certain den energy density, but um, the total efficiency of, this, um, of these approaches are calculated, and there's also a little bit of like a small wish list included. Um, this uh, this uh, total energy is in the range of more or less uh, 20%. Um, I put a question mark um, behind this 25% of the JAXA approach because they even said that they won't be as efficient as the, as the others are, so don't take this number too serious. Maybe, maybe we miscalculated it. Yes. So, yeah, with that, with those three approaches, I would say problem solved, isn't it? Concepts. Um, but there are some major challenges we want to point out here. Um, at first, um, this is the attitude and orbit control. So this station is in the uh, geostation near orbit. Um, there are several uh, TV satellites um, doing the same, and it's working quite well. But these um, TV satellites are about 1.8 to uh, metric tons, and this station we're talking about is about 10,000 tons, or 9 to 25,000 tons. Um, so this is a huge difference. Um, in the geostationary orbit, it's not a big deal to rotate. It's very slow. So the, um, uh, we just need to point towards the Earth to uh, hit the um, designated point on Earth we want to transfer the energy to. And then we uh, have a phased array antenna, so this, uh, these little uh, modules you saw before, uh, to form a beam which points exactly to the uh, receiving point at the Earth for the energy. Another point is the, the orbit control. This means the um, distance from Earth and the speed the station is traveling with. Um, this is another point. This is uh, already for TV satellites a little bit difficult to, uh, to do. Um, and now we have, a, as I said, this 1,000 uh, metric tons station to, to lift up to the uh, right distance or to uh, accelerate. Um, there are several uh, forces trying to um, push us out of the exact orbit, and we would lose the exact spot we want to point at. And there is um, the lunar gravity, the sun gravity, or solar gravity, and the flattened poles of the Earth. You know, the Earth is not a perfect sphere, it's more imperfect, it's more like a donut. You have uh, flattened points at the um, poles, which um, um, disturb the, the gravity field. Uh, there are solar winds and radiation pressure. Uh, solar wind comes from the sun. This is, these are particles hitting the station and pushing it out of the orbit. And there is radiation pressure, uh, the same, but comes from deep space. Um, this station is huge, so you have a huge surface. This is uh, different from the most TV satellites, so we have to overcome this. Uh, luckily, we have nearly unlimited energy with this station and we can use electrical thrusters so we don't need any fuel or propellant, maybe a little bit propellant, to bring up to the station. Uh, another point is the power transmission. I think this is the most critical point. Um, as I said, it's in the geostationary orbit and uh, I have an example here. I chose the MRSPS because the numbers are so round, but um, most of the concepts are similar as you saw before. So I think about a one gigawatt output station. And in the picture on the right on top, you can see the uh, yellow point is the uh, sending antenna. This would be about 1,000 meter in diameter. So this, this is about 110 soccer fields uh, placed in space. Um, this antenna is sending a microwave beam um, with 2.45 gigahertz or 5.8 gigahertz. These uh, frequencies are chosen because of the low attenuation or damping in the atmosphere. 
We want to transfer the most uh, energy. Um, and this beam uh, hits at the um, receiving antenna, or in the literature called uh, the rectenna. Um, and this rectenna uh, is going to be about 5,000 meters in diameter. This is 2,750 soccer fields, or about 20 times the um, Messe Leipzig area. So you can imagine this is, this is a big deal. If you think about uh, wind parks are ugly, then maybe you think about this area. Okay, so you can read more about if you like in the uh, references. We have um, a link to this. Uh, now you, uh, I guess you wonder about the efficiency of this. Uh, Anya talked about already a little bit. Um, I have the subsystems here including, and I think the most important part is this microwave beam. This is the third position. And this is actually not tested, so this is just a calculated number. Uh, this 85% or 9 to 95% is just from the studies we read. Um, current um, tests are more in the area of 1% or a few percent. Um, and the most studies are not really certain about the uh, total efficiency. So we have um, 18 to 24% with these numbers, and from other studies we have 13% to 25%, so this is most calculated. So now you uh, would wonder if, uh, wouldn't laser work for this? So microwave beep is, sounds nice, and you have this nice uh, receiving antenna, but a laser would be much smaller, I guess. So yes, basically you could use laser for this, um, and it would have a much higher ener energy density, so you uh, could hit a really smaller spot on the Earth to receive the energy. You don't have this five kilometers um, receiving antenna. But most of the research institutes don't want to talk about lasers. Um, I think it's just a little bit too obvious that you have some, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So this is the most technical things I think. I think. that and um, if we talk about these extremely large structures um, they have to be built and um, since they also are meant to be in the geostationary orbit where we have a certain radiation um, force and um, we want these components to operate for quite a long time they are usually quite expensive and get all the settle um, the, the certification for sending them up there is also very expensive somehow the SPS Alpha approach has thought about that and they are aiming at, although the, the numbers are varying very much, at, um, at a material cost of, um, of um, 250 kilograms at $250 per kilogram, which still is uh, uh, some, some billion dollars. And this is also a wish list. So um, they, they are aiming for this number in their third approach where they think that they already have the mass production and have the certification and the, the engineering and development cost all covered up already. There's another thing and this is the launch cost. So we are talking about a structure which is maybe 10,000 um, 10, tons large or heavy. Um, again, the SPS Alpha guys, they hope that they could launch a kilo for $600 uh, dollars into the low Earth orbit and continue from the low Earth orbit into the geostationary orbit with electrical tr thrusters. Okay, maybe if the BFR rocket uh, will be available for the price of the Falcon 9, maybe. Um, but this also would, would take some time. Just a re reality check right now. Um, for the prices the SpaceX uh, um, provides on their site, the Falcon Heavy, which, is, uh, which was erected today, I don't know whether you have heard that, so also the Falcon Heavy has not flown yet, but um, SpaceX hopes that they could sell the, the Falcon Heavy for um, 90 million dollars in order to lift 26 tons into geostationary orbit. But that would be approximately 400 launches for such a structure as the SPS Alpha, and also would cost um, some uh, tens of billion dollars. In addition to that, there are some other costs like uh, the initial orbit installation costs, which comes with 11 billion dollars and an operation of uh, 100 million a year. So it's quite expensive. Um, and probably this is also one of the reasons why we don't have um, space solar power um, yet. But still, I mean, we have technical problems. This is just money. Maybe it's also solvable, isn't it? 
yeah, so you know about the concept, you know about the challenges, and let's assume we can overcome these challenges, and uh, someone is funding this big station. Um, I think there are some uh, considerations about uh, if we really want to do this uh, at first. Um, so this beam is... Um, you need a precision of about one ten thousandth of a degree, plus minus, to hit, a, to hit the spot at the Earth. So this is like um, you want to hit a hazelnut over 100 meters uh, from a station flying with three kilometers per second. Um, if there's something goes wrong and the beam is uh, hitting the wrong spot, it's maybe, uh, yeah, you know, it's not a good idea. Um, or if some of the antennas are not really working well, the beam is not forming right and it's straying somewhere. So this is one point. If, let's assume everything works well and the beam is still going through the space and it's going through the atmosphere. And there are some other satellites going. Maybe if for an accident they go through the beam, what happens then? Or um, if you can't, or by accident, an airplane goes through the beam. So it's not even allowed to turn on your phone on the, on the airplane. Uh, you can imagine what happens if this beam with 50 watts per square meter um, hits the airplane. I don't want to sit in this. So and then uh, you can't avoid uh, that animals, birds, insects, whatever, go uh, through the beam. And yeah, maybe you have the same imagination like I have or we have, <laughs> and uh, it looks a little bit like this maybe. <laughs> it sounds pretty scary, I think. Um, doesn't it a little bit sound like an energy weapon? Uh, so um, we thought about, okay, 50 watts per square meter, that's not uh, like a nuclear weapon, but it's still, it could harm a lot. Um, there is a high energy density, and you can really fast readjust this beam. So you can point it in one second to the receiving antenna, and the next second you can just point it to some city, and a second later you point it just back. It's really fast to change. Um, it's not really defendable. I mean, uh, you can sit in a bunker and try to, to hide, uh, and maybe put your aluminum hat on. Uh, after all, it's useful. <laughs> but still, this thing is 24-7 on, so it could hit your bunker all the time. Um, and uh, last here is um, there's a lot of interest from uh, military uh, institutions. So this is... I think it's a little bit scary, okay. And then you would ask, but is it legal to install this kind of um, application? So basically, yeah, you see, um, there is already um, the United Nations Outer Space Treaty. It was first signed from the Russian Federation and the United Kingdom and the United States. And uh, now it's in the United Nations uh, treaties. And uh, most of the other countries signed it too. It's about all activities of states in the space. Um, what does it say about this case here? And it says there are no nuclear weapons or other weapons of mass destruction allowed in uh, outer space. As always, there's a backdoor. If, this, if you install a military object in outer space with a scientific reason, then it's allowed again. So. Another point is, um, in this treaty, you uh, must not influence the Earth environment at all. There are no real studies about this, but um, I have a feeling it's going to influence somehow the environment. But I'm not sure about this. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> so finally, um, this, all this funding and this technology and the knowledge is necessary, so it's only possible by some, so some few states to build this. And how do you prevent that certain leaders of states or whoever want to build this uh, is misuse this technology? So I can't give you an answer on that, but I think there are some who shouldn't have this. Um, yeah, and, and you, maybe you can add, uh, think about this after the talk. And yeah, now we have some uh, take-home words for you. 
from Anja. So yes, the concepts are existing, and we don't say that they are um, that they should not be discussed and that they are uh, entirely evil. The um, it's technologically feasible, at least um, that uh, that's proposed some studies. But uh, I mean, it's still challenging. Um, the technology is not there yet. But the moral questions are still open. So yes, it's still pretty science fiction. And as I said, we don't say it's um, we should not do that at all. But at least we should um, think about it and be um, be critical with uh, this kind or also with other um, new technologies. So, but right now maybe. We should um, think about is there um, is there another solution to to this energy problem? Maybe a more realistic, maybe a less problematic one. I mean.